Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our session here. We got uh, paper to digital workflows and animation. I'm Kyle Runciman. I'm a product marketing manager that specializing in media and entertainment at Wacom. And my colleague, Brian Wilson, who's also a product marketing manager at uh, Tanizel Products in Americas. And we're joined by our special guest, Tony Bancroft. Hey, guys. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, let's just run down the list of all the Tony's accomplishments because it is extensive. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, animator at Disney, you might recognize some of his characters, the animation that he's worked on. Uh, Pumbaa from Lion King, Kronk <laughs> from Emperor's New Groove, Cogsworth from Beauty and the Beast, and Lago from Aladdin. Uh, Award-winning director, co-director from Mulan, won the Annie Award for Director of the Year. Uh, animation supervisor on Stuart Little 2, received the Visual Effects Society top award for character animation there. Authored a book called Director, Directing for Animation, Everything You Didn't Learn in Art School. He's got a podcast with his brother, uh, Tom Bancroft, uh, the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast. Uh, yeah. On and on. Did I miss anything, Tony? Um, uh, you know, I've, I've actually won a couple um, uh, swimsuit competitions in Florida about Brian's way. He gave me some competition a little bit a couple years ago. I was, I was close. It was really you close. Got you got That's me. before he had that magnificent beard. Otherwise, I think he would have been the winner for sure. <laughs> no, I'm really proud of, happy to be here, guys, too, and talk about the thing that I love the most, which is animation um, and, and how it's evolved over the years has been really fascinating for me. You know, I'm, I've been in the year, in the industry over 33 years, done all kinds of things in animation. I mean, I've swept the floors all the way to cleanup drawings and key assistant animation, supervising animation, directing, producing. I mean, kind of everything in every format, too, from commercials to direct to video things and feature films at Disney, all kinds of stuff. So and even CG animation, too, with Stuart Little, too, and other things that I've been involved with. So. I'm really happy to to be here to talk to everybody about this. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, so I guess, yeah, the, the topic of this conversation is the transition from paper to digital workflow. Is, should we go back to the start and how you got into animation? Yeah, you know, um, it's funny because I teach at Lipscomb University <laughs> here in Tennessee. My brother and I both, actually. I have a twin brother, Tom Bancroft, that's also in animation. And um, so we... We both started a program here in Tennessee at Lipscomb over nine years ago. My brother started it and now I've taken it over. And one thing that I see that all the students are really interested in when they first get there is they grew up with these hand-drawn 2D animated features that I worked on like in the 90s. You know, you see some of it around here. That's my animation desk there. I know people are wondering what that big piece of furniture is. And I used to animate on that in paper. And there's this, you know, kind of alchemy, I guess, kind of magical element to animating on paper that, that students still really love. They want to talk about it. They want to be part of that. Well, things move on. Things change. Things progress. And that's what I'm excited to talk about because the progressions with technology have been vast. And um, I can animate now from home, from wherever I want and work on a major production. I've done that with Warner Brothers and Disney, over, even over the last five years, I've been involved with Disenchanted, which came out on Disney Plus. I did that all here from home on my Wacom Cintiq using Toon Boom Harmony. That was a, everything has turned Toon Boom Harmony in the animation industry for 2D. And so, and then I also worked on recently um, a Warner Brothers feature that hasn't come out, so I can't say too much about it, but it was all, you know, um, uh, and Daffy and Goofy and characters like that. And it was all done on Toon Boom. But I, I promise on my social media for my fans that follow me at Pumbaa Guy on Instagram, I, I brought in, uh, brought in, brought in from my garage, um, a little 12 fill. This is how we used to do it, guys. So right on, a, a right over there on, a, on that kind of desk right there, I animated from from Aladdin, this is Yago the parrot, you know, Gilbert Gottfried, rest in peace. He did the voice. And this is where the Sultan stuffs a cracker into his. He's sitting on the shoulder of Jafar's shoulder, and he's going, no, no, no. And there's a little hand there in front of him of the Sultan with a cracker, and you'll see it pop in here because he thrusts the cracker into Yago's throat, all the way through the back of his throat, I might add. <laughs> and then pulls his hand out and now he's got cracker in his mouth as he comes forward hits a funny kind of take here blink 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 on a separate layer 
And then Woosley gets pulled out of the scene as Jafar stands up and he goes out. So this is all, and I'll do it one more time fast so you can see it. And then boom, he gets that stuffed in his mouth. He comes forward into the take. There's a blink there. It's on a separate layer and then he gets pulled out. So this is how we would do it. And, but you can see all the papers, all the trees were killing back then. Um, and then there was a special way of flipping and all that. And there's, trust me, I loved it. I mean, I love that. But um, when, when I could move over to a new technology, I was always seeking that next thing. And so for me, it came about, um, I think the first production that I did in um, Toon Boom Harmony. Yeah, you know what? I think it was um, Green Eggs and Ham. So for Netflix, it was the TV show Green Eggs and Ham. And I got a couple scenes freelance on that while I was teaching. And I picked it up pretty quickly. Um, I use, I don't do a lot of the puppet kind of stuff, which my students are getting into. And that's, to me, that's really where things are at right now is puppet mm -hmm. animation where you actually have little little uh, pre-drawn figures and stuff and you're manipulating arms and stuff like that. It's not quite Disney quality traditional full animation, but sure. very viable, very much in, in need right now. So I'm always pointing my, my uh, students towards doing more puppet animation. But for me, I've switched over. If I can share my screen, I'm going to show you guys a scene I did for um, Warner Brothers Space Jam, A New Legacy. And you're going to see what 2D animation looks like now uh, as we've geared over towards digital. Can you see that? Okay, this is a scene uh, with Marvin the Martian in it, LeBron James. Let me go back to the beginning here. It's got Marvin's little dog in there, Bugs Bunny. Here, here it is. For real? I claim this planet in the name of Mars. My good. For real? That's it. It starts over. I claim this planet in the name of Mars. So that's when uh, he comes down in the spaceship and he and he plants his flag there. So uh, an effects animator did the flag later on. I didn't do very much with that, but you can see as a character animator, I'm more concerned about the performances. Look at this though. I love to do underdrawing, um, just like I did on paper. You saw that with my Yago character. It was like in blue and then there was black on top. I still work that same way. All the same processes and pipeline that I enjoyed in, um, in doing 2D animation on paper, I'm still doing it here, except for interbase programs. So when I draw something, say it's, I don't know, a weird looking, not Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> and and I want to I want to select something, I want to erase something. I could just pick a whole line here. Look at that. How how easy that is for me just to be able to go swipe. I'm even just I'm just touching the, the the tip of the line and it captures the whole stroke. So every time I pick up my pencil, it's considered a stroke. And um, and it doesn't even matter if it crosses another line. And that's what I love because when I was erasing on paper, I could I couldn't erase this whole line without affecting the line underneath it, right? right. But here I can do this and boom, it's gone. <clears throat> this one here is kind of touching, boom, it's gone. Say I want to make this eye a little bit larger too. Um, I can just get that eye and I can transform it pretty easily too by just using some of these, these uh, look at this, I can make it larger, boom. Now it's the, now he's got that weird expression on him. If I feel like my nose is a little bit too large, it's off model, boom. I can make it a little nose. Um, that, you know, that kind of changes and making those kind of things, let alone the undo button, which is everybody's favorite, right? Boom, 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 boom. I can go forward. I can, oh, I don't really like that change I made. Okay, let me put it back. It, boom, 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 it's there. So I'm doing all of this stuff so much faster. And really that's what it's about. How do we become faster so that we can be more employable? I'm, I'm just gonna say, that's, that's right. really what it comes down to guys is, how do you make yourself more employable in this very competitive market? And for me, it doesn't matter that I have a bunch of, um, let me stop screen sharing here. I was just gonna ask, do you find yourself trying to cap the number of layers you're using in a scene like that to, to keep that speed going? Or do you find I, it? Yeah, 
That does, I mean, the program, and, and it depends on the, the processor you have in your computer and how much memory and stuff, of course, but I do, it will start to bog down. I have four, five different characters and props going on in this. There's a lot of layers from layout and the background stuff that was given to me in the scene. It starts to bog down a little bit for my computer. So I will turn off layers as I'm working on, say I'm just working on Marvin. And once I kind of know the placement and the choreography of the scene, I can start dropping characters and just concentrate on one character at a time. And that way, when I play it back, it's playing it at a good speed, proper rate. So what about in betweening? Uh, is that something you do with digitally or do you, are, because it's digital, do you, do you do the keyframes and then send maybe that out digitally for some of the in-betweeners that you take that over or? Uh, yeah, I was actually in California and using an in-betweener that was in Arizona. I, I think it was on this production, but they were living out of state. Now we made this production, by the way, during COVID. So I started three months on the lot. We were all together, very traditional studio kind of atmosphere, buddy, buddy. We're all together. Boom. COVID hits, they kicked us out, but they said, just grab your computers and go home and set up and we'll get back to work. We were set up as a production, Space Jam and New Legacy. Uh, we set up in within, I think a week, week and a half, the whole yeah, team right. was wow. back up. Wow. And we were, we were running Toon Boom Harmony. We were working digitally. We were transferring files back and forth with a secure server and didn't miss a beat. Like this, this film would not have come out in theaters if it wasn't for um, this latest technology. Imagine that if I was doing it all on paper and I had to pass off scenes all the time, we're touching the same paper during COVID. Yeah. You know what that was like in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even kiss your wife. You know? It was up. just like, you, know, you stay away from people. It's like the plague. So, you know, but we were, you know, in the old days we were touching everything and, you know, licking our papers and kissing them and whatever. And uh, <laughs> it was crazy. Um, you can do that during COVID. So, you know, Toon Boom Harmony, we were thriving as an animation industry where all the other industries were shut down, live action and stuff. It was all right. in person, so they had to shut down. Um, we were, you know, our industry thrived during that time. That's pretty impressive. It was, so it was a great time. Even if you were able to get set up, that's awesome. I mean, I was probably the most productive during that time. And if it wasn't for the technology and that I'd already made the leap over, to the technology and working, um, you know, digitally, I wouldn't have survived uh, as an employed animator. And it doesn't matter if you're a veteran or not. You could be the greatest, most in-demand animator, Glenn Keane, you know, and um, <laughs> you're going to be, you know, streeping sweet streets for a while or tarring roofs if you if you can't adapt. And so that's always been my philosophy is try and adapt to the new thing. Don't be scared of the new technology. Try and adapt as much as possible because you can't stop it. You can't stop changes. Things are going to try and speed up. And pr production is all about, I mean, that's why they call it show business, right? Is that it's all about the business. So producers, employers, they're going to try and uh, make sure that they can keep aggressive with getting things out at a less expensive and a quicker rate. Were there stages in the transition between traditional to digital for you? Like, did you find yourself scanning your traditional artwork and then working on it digitally? Or was it a full, I'm done with paper, well, move into the computer? Yeah, I mean, um, for the fans out there, uh, you might be surprised to know I worked on Cuphead, the video game, for a oh, little bit. There was a little freelance I got from Cuphead. Now, those guys up in Canada, those crazy Canadians, I could say that because uh, we got one Canadian here at least. Um, <laughs> They uh, they were really kind of old school fans, and you could tell that I mean, they just have a love affair with you know like 1930s uh, Disney era and, and Fleischer animation. So they wanted to do it all on paper. That's how they had done the first Cuphead, and we we were working on like a, a an addition additional level. I, they call them on DCP or I don't know what it was. Um, <laughs> somebody can correct me. Um, and they wanted to do it all on paper, and so I found myself animating on paper, but then I had to, I didn't have a down shooter anymore, you know, like a, an actual camera. I had to scan all my artwork. I put it into the software and that's how I could time it out. So I had to, I had to find some hybrid way of working that was a little clunky. And mm -hmm. I was just so badly just wanting to, can I just animate it on my Cintiq? You know, I, I, you can't see it here, but I have this beautiful 32 inch. It's one of the biggest ones they make 32 inch pro. Cintiq by Wacom. 
Um, and I do all my work here. Um, so this is great, but it's for looks. It's kind of dusty and dull, unfortunately. I do traditional drawing on that for commissions and whatever, but I'm always over here in front of, just off screen over here, my Wacom um, Cintiq, because that's where the, you know the big projects are getting done. What was your first Wacom tablet? Um, I started with a 21 UX. Ah, nice. <laughs> Suri's trying to, to bop in here. She found me. She heard something I said and said something. Um, but yeah, I started with a 21-inch Wacom UX. And I had that for years. Uh, that's the other thing I like about the Wacom products here is that they're really well built. Um, you know, I, I like I said, I'm the program director at uh, Lipscomb University. We've rigged out all of our classrooms with Wacom Cintiqs. Right now we have the 21-inch HDs. Um, and, and we're upgrading now to some of the, um, I think it's the 27 inch pro, which is the newest in the line. Um, really liking those, um, but they're just really stable work workhorses for mon as a, as a monitor you can draw on. And I know that's not the way you guys describe it, but you know, that's how I describe it to my friends. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. I yeah. mean, it works, right? Um, Absolutely. I've had so many monitors on, you know, extra monitors and stuff on the side that I use connected with my Wacom or my computer or something. And they're always fizzing out. The color's always going, but I feel like the Wacom products are so well made and crafted that they hold on to the, the stable colors. I don't see any kind of waning. It doesn't have a really bright glare. Uh, even at the end of the day, I'm still not weary. I'm more weary looking at my, my Macintosh, my iMac, uh, uh, computer that I have because it can be so bright and intense sometimes, but there's right. something about the Wacom that um, feels very real. It's got, um, you can get different textures for it too. I've heard other 2D animators complain about, oh, it's too smooth. The glass is too smooth or whatever. And I've found that people sell different textures if you want to apply that on top, but I've gotten used to the Wacom Cintiq texture. It's not quite glass. There is a bit of a tooth to it. So, yep. and the brushes that are being made now is, has been a game changer for me. You know, for a long time I was in like TV paint or something and I never found that they upgraded their brushes very much because I wanted a real traditional pencil feel from the brush that I was using. Um, and so I was able to upgrade to that. I've also been really into the, the, you know, and a lot of students, my students, they're in Procreate on the iPad. That's great. I call that a sketchbook, a, a real traveling kind of sketchbook. I think it's great for that, but I cannot for the life of me get the kind of uh, sensitivity that the Cintiqs have and the stylus. And, and I think this is the number three that I have now with my uh, 31 inch uh, pro. The, 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 tens uh, the, the sensitivity to my pressure and being able to get a slight thick and thin with the line, I can't control that so much. I use the iPad all the time for sketching and stuff, but I cannot get the kind of professional quality drawing that I experienced when, when I had the control on paper, you know, being able to draw on paper. Um, and I trained myself for so many years to get a, a certain kind of flowing line. I was not getting that with the, the stylus um, from iPad, but I do on the Cintiq. And it's because, I mean, how many pressure points of sensitivity do you guys have now on these? You guys know the product so well. 8,000. Yeah, there's over 8,000. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. The sensitivity that you can get from this. And I don't know the, I don't understand how it works. There's some kind of witchcraft involved that I think you guys come up with. Exactly. But, <laughs> yeah. Right. Spells and <laughs> incantations. But um, I, I just know that, you know, when I get a great brush, I find the right brush that has a really good pencil uh, feel to it from what it looks like on the screen. And then I combine it with the sensitivity of this. I don't really, I don't really miss the old days of paper and pencil anymore. And I guess that's the, that's really the theme of what we're talking about is making that switch over. I'm, I'm always surprised when I hear of anybody that's still animating on paper and God bless you, <laughs> but there's, there's just the whole I, look, guys, I just recently went to Atlanta because I did was on. I'm in Tennessee now and I just moved out here to Nashville. Well, I want to be a good instructor and program director of my program. I want to help students get jobs in the industry. That's really what it should be out. Go to a school that's going to help you get the skill sets 
and also set you up by creating a portfolio that you can get into the industry and get a job. That's that's hard to do these days. It's a very competitive market, as students know, that are in, in school right now. So I went to Atlanta. That's like right over the hill for us. You know, it's a good, you know, it's about four hours away by drive. I went out there to check out the scene because um, because of you guys know this in Canada, tax credits are really helpful. Productions sure. go out um, to Absolutely. Canada because of those tax credits. Well, Atlanta has the most uh, competitive tax credits in the United States for animation. And so productions are going out there. That's why Cartoon Networks is out there and Bento Box is out there and um, and then Floyd County uh, Productions. There's a lot of semi, you know, medium level studios and even larger studios that have opened up there in Atlanta for animation and then a ton of commercial studios. So I went out there to get the landscape. Here's the one thing that I heard from every single studio that I toured around. And I went through three to five, at least of the big ones in one day. And every single one of the producers and directors I bumped into talked about, are your students learning Toon Boom Harmony? <laughs> that, that's all they wanted to know. They, they didn't know want to know like the quality of the students or, you know, when are people available? When's your portfolio day? They're just like, they want to know about the curriculum. Are you teaching Toon Boom Harmony at, at in the college level? Because they're not seeing enough um, college level programs that are doing that. And all of the studios are using Toon Boom Harmony. They've, they've totally changed over to um, a digital pipeline. Um, it doesn't matter if they're doing commercials or if they're doing, you know, little things for the web or if they're doing feature films, they're all working in Toon Boom Harmony. And a lot of the puppet anim type animation too. So that was the other call for uh, like, do you guys have any riggers there that know Toon Boom Harmony? Do you guys have any animators that are exclusive to Toon Boom Harmony doing puppet type animation? And um, we were like, I, I wanted to say yes, uh, but I, I knew that our, our program was lacking. So now we're hiring an instructor that is focused just on harmony uh, puppet animation techniques and that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll train students as they come into Lipscomb, I'll train them on how to animate 2D traditional animation. We'll go frame by frame. We'll talk about squash and stretch and all the principles, but then I'm gonna turn them over in year three and four to a Toon Boom Harmony instructor that is really specialized in that digital um, um, software and understanding of that pipeline, that's gonna give them, all of my students are gonna get that benefit going off into the market because that's where the market's at. That's amazing. So you mentioned the rigging and the puppets. Is there any other specific skill sets or workflows that these studios are looking for within Toon Boom or outside of Toon Boom? Well, compositing, um, you know, how to put things together is, is really a big element. Um, at our school, we're actually working on a series called Dead Sea, Dead sea Squirrels. It's a new um, faith-based <laughs> um, 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 uh, uh, series that's, um, that was created by one of our instructors, Mike Naraki. He's, uh, from, he's Larry the Cucumber and, and helped create mm -hmm. VeggieTales. So um, really creative guy. He came up with this Dead Sea Squirrels idea. And our students are actually working on bits and pieces, you know, whole chunks of, of the Dead Sea Squirrels series. And it, it was all done in Toon Boom Harmony because that's what the distributors wanted. That's They wanted that. They wanted a lower cost point. Um, and so from the day one, it was started out that way. Well, we didn't, we weren't training. This was before I got there, but we weren't training the students in Toon Boom. And so all of a sudden we needed all these different elements of uh, understanding the pipeline. We needed compositors, we needed riggers, we needed animators. So we had to train really quick a, lo a lot of our upperclassmen just to do that series. But now they're going to university, they're learning the basics, and they're also working on professional, they're getting credits doing a professional gig in for uh, Dead Sea Squirrels that's going to be coming out really soon on a streaming channel. It has a budget, they're getting paid to go to college and learn and get a credit on a professional thing. We're one of the only universities doing that sort of thing. We call it our, our Imagine House Practicum. And it's one of the reason that, that we're the number one animation program already in Tennessee. It's really growing like crazy. But we're, we're trying to be aggressive to where, I'll tell you, I, I say this only because I went to CalArts and I feel like, um, you know, California is to the arts, one of the biggest colleges in, in uh, the United States and one of the very first ones to be teaching Disney quality animation. I learned from all the best. I love my time there, but 
they didn't adapt well. And I was, it was one of the things that I kept going, come on, CalArts, adapt to the new thing. They weren't getting a CG animation when Toy Story came out and Pixar was thriving. They were still talking about old days, 2D animation and everything's going, um, you know, and I, I love that there's a tradition of, of hand-drawn animation, but if the industry changes and moves, you got to stay with it, guys. You got to just keep up with that. Otherwise, you're going to be out by yourself in a pasture pretty soon. So I'm all about wanting my students to have the most aggressive and um, kind of now, inter um, not entertainment, but um, sense of what's going on now in the industry. So I'm always trying to reach out to studios, understand where they're at, where they're going, and then um, help my students to be able to get there in their journey. You mentioned before we went live that you have students coming into your program that are looking to learn traditional animation. Do you know why that might be? There's a love, you know, there's a love for it. They just grew up with it. I mean, I mean, it is fun. I can pick up this little pad and I can flip it really quick and people are like, oh, wow, I can't believe that. Uh, you know, it's it's the same joy that you get, I think, when you're a kid and you do a flip book for the first time and you see it move. There's just a, kind of a, a magical life that happens. And we all know that, you know, OK, that's it's just a process. It's the animator that brings that life to it and stuff. So it doesn't matter if that process is on paper or if it's digital. It doesn't matter how you get out, if it's stop motion, you know, if it's paint on glass. There's a lot of ways to do it. They're all just different techniques and mediums. But really it does come down to there's just a fondness uh you know and and culture has look guys i mean I'll, I'll be honest with you when i was doing these films lion king and aladdin and beauty and the beast and stuff i thought wow okay they're popular in the theaters right now but i had no idea no idea that they would go on and be these <laughs> cultural icons that they are these touch points for our society um, so it, it always amazes me that my students come into the program and they're just like, you created my childhood <laughs> and I, I, it freaks me out. I mean, I, I, one, it makes me feel old. Um, and, and, uh, two, but I, I love it. I, I love it. And I just never expected it. And st I still have to kind of pinch myself that, that that's still relevant. Um, but it also goes to show you that animation is here to stay. And don't get me started on AI, guys, because I'm going to go off. But animation is you here. Just had a question up on chat. There are some questions in there. Yeah. <laughs> Hand-drawn animation. You see is those here questions, today. guys. We're going to get them to the at the end. At just about 15 minutes left. We're going to. Oh, there's questions, questions about AI and stuff. I haven't been scrolling oh, yeah. through those. There are. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I just recently did a video with Corridor Crew. If you know them on YouTube, and where um, we talked about their AI short and stuff. So. Um, I know there's, and my brother and I are coming out with a podcast this Friday to talk about that very same thing. Um, it's, it's a very real technology. Um, and, and like I said about Toon Boom Harmony and Wacom Cintiq and going digital, I don't want to go into being scared of AI. I don't want to, I want to be able to look at it and say, is there some real value to how we use it? Um, okay. I'm going off on track here, but <laughs> <laughs> let's keep it to paper to digital right now. Um, <laughs> but what do you guys think? I mean, you guys are, are, are on the front line of Toon Boom Harmony. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about what do you see schools doing? What do you see studios doing and where do you think they're going? With regards to AI, you mean specifically no, to no, us? No, uh, with regards to digital animation and, um, doing things digitally now. Brian, you want to take that one? Just do you have more of a input on the uh, animation I, side of things? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good, uh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to wrap my head around it. Um, yeah, I, I think obviously uh, th things are going digital. I, it, it's as simple as that. Um, when I was in school at SCAD, Static College Art Design, we didn't have Wacom's, we didn't have Cintiqs, anything like that. But now, you know, every single studio does. And the, the software that you're using, you know, you almost have to become an expert in the software um, and, and to be, being part of that. So I, I think it's very important. And I, I, I am, you know, the digital quality, you know, but I see a lot of um, like recent um, uh, movies, et cetera, animation, you know, where they, they it's digitally created, but it's made to look traditional. Right. Um, yeah. It's given that. So I see a lot of that happening. 
Um, you know, you're, you're using these tools to, to advance and to make it quicker, faster, more efficient, but we're making it look old school, which I find very interesting. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, progress even going towards that with the shading and yeah. the line work. Oh. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's and, hear it for Arcane, right? I, I mean, I oh, beautiful. Yes. There. That painterly look. Now that's CG, but there's also applications that they're using to make it more look 2D and stuff. We saw that with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse where people were like, dang, that looked good. It looked like the old 2D stuff I love. Yes. Um, you know, that that's the exciting thing. That's when I think technology and, and the, the power of it, but also what artists are using it for, how artists are using it is how uh, that's what's going to drive um, new ex exciting storytelling, new exciting styles, things like that. Guys, I got to tell you too. When we're talking, you were talking, Brian, just now about um, saving steps and getting faster. To me, that's a big part of why I adapted over to Tune Boom Harmony. Also, is uh, some of those things I was showing you earlier about how quick and easy it is to make changes and iterations. But see this little thing here. This is my remote. Okay, so you've seen these on the side of the Cintiqs. I'm gonna I'm gonna confess something to you. I've never used this remote until recently when it was my students at school that had these on the side of the Cintiq. And I'm like, oh, oh, and I was like drawing on their Cintiq. I'm like, let me let me show you how to do something. And I was drawing for them and I bumped the remote. And I'm like, get this thing off there. That shouldn't be on there. I, so I like pushed it aside and they're like, no, no, check this out. And they were like, they put it back on the Cintiq, pop, you know, and it sticks there with a little magnet. And then they're like animating and they're going like, boop, 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 you know, and hitting hot keys that are on the, that's what this is designed for. It's all about hotkeys. And I was never into hotkeys. I was doing things like going, reaching up here to undo all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then I'm getting like a pain in my old man elbow. So <laughs> they're showing me how to use those hotkeys. And it was so much faster. I, I'm a true believer now. And, and I think it just points towards one thing, which is like, you know, you'll, you'll only get old if you don't, if you stop learning new things. That's and right. yeah. I, I learned so much from my students. I love that about teaching. So, you know, they're, they're teaching me too. It's great. Yeah, I, I'm in a industrial design background. I went to school you know, 20 years ago now. So I was, I've always hated computers. I guess I still kind of do. But uh, so I was anti-digital for a long run. We did uh, d develop the products in SolidWorks and I opted to draft by hand, which is, this is 2007, 2008, which is ridiculous at the time. So I was using a T-square and everyone's looking at me like I'm completely out of touch and I was. But uh, now I get to play with all these different softwares at Wacom and using uh, the, every different tablet available. I've been using Wacom tablets for 15 years, but never took advantage of the full express key and like all the production tools within the Wacom environment. Like there's yeah. so much. So even the, the buttons on the pen, I didn't use those ever. I just disabled them. And now I realize how yeah. useful they can be just for like color picker or undo the things that you're using all the time. Just hit those and you're, you you just start flying after a while. So Yeah, you have to think a little bit. Like when you first pick up the pen, you got to think about your finger placement just for a moment. Yep. So you're not sitting there on top of that button. You know, you want to be able to like, it's like, it's like getting in a car and starting it and putting your foot on the brake. You know, you got to learn, your, train yourself not to like go right to it. Just put your, go on the gas and then go to the brake when you need it. So, right. you know, that's what the button is for me. I'm drawing over here. And then when I need to switch to use the button, I got to be just a little bit more conscious of it. But it's amazing how you, your, your body adapts to that. That kind of memory sensor thing is, is a, is a saver. Well, you know, speaking of that, here's a little commercial um, in a way. So the, yeah. the new Cintiq Pro 27, right? Uh, it perfect transition to that. That's we we removed some of the keys in the past, but with the new 27, we have four on each side, right? So we added those back in because there was a lot of discussion while well, we like the physical keys, and so there's four on each side. It's kind of a grip style, so it's even faster. You know, muscle memory comes into play there. Um, so that's really, on the and stylus, then with our, right? On the stylus and on the stylus, yeah. The new pen has three buttons now instead of two. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, three, oh, oh yeah, 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 and these pens are new too, so now you can customize the thickness, the width, the weight, you counterbalance it. Um, so there's a lot of thought put into the uh, the you know, the express keys and the feel and the ergonomics of these because it, it is a comfort, comfort, efficiency, right? Yeah, 
I, you haven't lost the eraser. On, I love the eraser on the end. That's to me. That's the old school piece that I really love is turning it over and erasing real quick. I've gotten so used to just flipping it around. <laughs> we did lose the eraser. The eraser is not on the new pen, unfortunately. Oh, what? That's what but yeah. that's why there's a third button, right? So instead of flipping, oh. it, you just just click it. You can. Oh, you can okay. Uh, okay. So well, I get some use. You, you know, for old school guys like me, I just got to train myself for that. The changes aren't always bad. It's just that I'm used to a certain thing. And I yeah. think that's the one thing that I notice is that, and I learned this from my students too, they adapt so much faster than I do because I've been drawing with a pencil for so long with the eraser on the end that I'm turning over and they're like, you know, that's not good for your hand always, you know, doing that kind of movement and switch it. And you're also losing time. So I can see why the, you know, a younger generation person would be like, We'll just put that on the on the, the clicker there. You know that makes more sense. So it is one of those things I just got to use. Yeah. Well, you know, we still you can still use the older pens with the erasers on That's this right. new one yeah. as well. So we we still allow that to happen. <laughs> You're allowing that. I love we it. We allow that to happen. We allow you to be satisfied <laughs> with the <our> product. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the students we've talked to have really like getting back on the new pens. You can sort of remove the button. But I'm just going to no do this real quick because you unscrew the back. And then there's the weight the rip off. Hold on, I'm losing my. Yeah, it's, it's fully customizable, right? So weight, oh, balance, cool. all that good stuff. So now it's as thin as like a regular pencil, which is there's been oh. slim pens that you can buy in addition to your regular one, but this one out of the box is really nice. And you know, wow. switching that that thickness throughout the day helps with the carpal tunnel. I find at least, so if you're stuck at the same grip for eight or ten hours, it. Your knuckles That's start true. To feel it at the end of the day. Wow. See, now I'm learning something new too. I love this. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that. Yeah, I've I, I have a love hate relationship with buttons on there sometimes too, and I've had to adapt, like I was saying. But just the option that you can pull those out and it's streamlined. That's pretty cool, and I love the waiting idea too. All right. Well, I got to try one of those now. Send me one, okay, Kyle. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You're committed. It's uh, it's live and recorded. Yeah, it's recorded. I oh, okay. No, uh -oh. Aaron's gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's probably a good time. Do we want to start asking some, uh, answering some questions? What do you guys think? Sure. Think Let me just uh, scroll up to the top of the list because I've been keeping an eye on them, but wanted to hold off until we were ready for it. First one was how long did the Iago uh, flipbook take for you to produce all part <laughs> uh, per page? I think was the question. Per page? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to gauge per, per page, but this was probably a scene that I animated in a week, a week time at Disney, and that's that's counting, you know, going into. If you want to go to me large again, that's counting going to uh, the director, roughing it out, showing my supervising animator, and then showing the director. And so all those iterations, there was probably three or four different changes I made to it. I had some drawovers for my supervising animator to tweak some of the poses a little bit. Um, so yeah, all in all, I probably probably took me a week to animate that. And it's probably like three and a half seconds. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, we yeah. all know that if we've gotten an animation at all, it's a slow and laborious process and I've never been really fast, but, um, again, I, I will say that I've, I think my speed has improved going to digital. Um, but that, you know, in the old days, in the nineties and stuff, there was more time. Um, I would say anyway, productions these days are a lot more rushed. I don't love sure. that, but I also know that to be competitive in the marketplace, you have to speed up. So it's that forced because me to go uh, faster. Because and of the increased need for content, like there's so much more content that needs to be developed. And that's it. And that's yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, it is about um, just the demand um, has risen. And that all happened due to, you know, the pandemic. You know, everybody went to streaming and streaming blew up and streaming needed product. And so that's what drives the industry. So when you're looking at a job on a job board, if you look back at us as to why that job is there, it's because people are, are streaming like crazy and, and they, they're getting bored. So when people get yeah. bored, we get jobs. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, next question from Aaron. Uh, have you always been a character animator or did you self-select into during that, during your career? Um, uh, when I was at CalArts, there was a moment where I almost got into layout. I had a teacher that was teaching 
layout background design that I just loved and and seeing what he did and how much he loved layout swayed me for a minute. But no, before that and even after that, I, I really have always been 100% a character guy. My brother and I started out doing comic strips together um, and comic books and things like that and then found animation a little bit later, um, like, like right before we were going to college. And then switch gears immediately, fell in love with it because it had everything that I love. I, what I love about animation is that it's it's acting and it's um, you know it's filmmaking, um, it's um, timing and 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 all the things that I love uh, wrapped up into one thing: storytelling. Um, and then on top of it, it, it it has what I fell in love with first and foremost, which is drawing and drawing funny pictures. To me, there's nothing like having a life where you get to go to work and sit down and draw funny pictures. And uh, I love my life because of that. You mentioned acting. Is that Do you use reference material? Like do you record yourself making facial scenes and then use that as reference for your animation? Yeah, and I have, you know, you've seen pictures of like the nine old men and stuff or old time animators. They got the mirror. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> got it. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's see what it looks like if you see yourself in, on the internet. Do you see yourself yeah. anywhere? Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> or, or, or. that's weird. Okay. But yeah, um, and I'll post, you know, I'll, I'll act things out. I do it mostly because I, I find that uh, if I'm going to have a character gesture or something like that, I might do it myself and, and not even really look at myself doing it. I want to feel it more than anything. What does that feel like? Okay. What muscles am I using? I start to kind of analyze it in my mind. How quick is this gesture? How much, you know, how do I have a little snap back here that I'm doing when I do it, you know, and, and then how do I caricaturize that as Bugs Bunny or Yosemite Sam or something like that? So I'll act things out quite a bit, but I rarely videotape myself like they do in CG animation a lot these days. Okay. Uh, next question is from Beatrice. She asks, uh, what was the biggest challenge when switching from paper to digital? I mean, the biggest challenge was um, what we talked about a little bit before, which is I didn't like the feel of it um, at first. So training myself to understand that I'm drawing on a surface that is a little slicker, that doesn't have the same tooth as the paper. The the ability that I had, I I'd spent so much time drawing um, paper and pencil that I knew that when I pushed a certain way, it was going to give me a certain look with the line. It was going to it was going to thicken out a little bit. I'm going to get a, a little heavier line on the bottom of the shape or something like that. I could sculpt a shape a lot easier because of that. And that all had to do with just training myself um, pencil to paper. Well, I had to adapt and, and I had to find brushes that gave me that feel. So I became a real studier of like, I didn't really like the change to digital until I worked on Space Jam and some one of the tech guys there introduced me to a bunch of brushes that he designed and they were like they were being used as like the production brushes for a pencil effect for a good pencil feel and then I I put those into my system and I was like okay now I'm I feel like I'm drawing again and um and that combined with the fact that the stylus even back then you know and this is early 2020 2019 whatever um the stylus was already sophisticated enough and it's only gotten better from the technology that you guys are involved with there at um at wacom cintiq um wacom and really um, made this sophisticated enough that i was okay with the amount of uh, pressure sensitivity already and it's only gotten better but it wasn't until i found brushes that really mm -hmm. met my needs also right then i really adapted and i changed over and it's been a hundred percent just out of curiosity, when you're on paper, do you use like mechanical pencils or do you have to continue sharpen your pencil? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, uh, polychromos. They're from Germany. Uh, that's what I like when you see the the, the kind of bluish purple lines underneath yep. there. That's a polychromos. And for graphite, I'm usually a 2B guy. Um, and I love the um, – and now I can't find them. Blackwing pencils are great. I don't know. I have this one too. This is a Mitsubishi. Oh, this is a 10B. I don't know if you ever heard of a 10B pencil. Yeah. 
That's Such dark stuff. <laughs> this is the Glen Keen pencil right here. Okay. So uh, wow. it's a Mitsubishi High Uni. I don't know what that means. Um, but these little pencils I ordered online because I heard Glenn Keen was using them. <laughs> And it's such a it's such a silly thing that you think a pencil is going to make you a better artist. Um, but I still fell for it. And I, I just wanted to try what a 10B felt like. And it's like it's like animating with butter. It's really hard to control for me. But, um, yeah. you know, God bless Glenn, Glenn Keane. He's got it down. There's something to uh, new materials, getting you the extra confidence to improve your work. I think where you're focusing a little bit more on, you know, making that first sketch with the new tool better. I just find that trying new tools and going in new directions, not only does it help you evolve as an anim uh, animator, as an artist in general, but, um, you know, it adds excitement. Um, change can be a good thing. I feel, I just feel like in life, we, we get hung up on change being a negative a lot of times, but mm -hmm. change could be a good thing too. And I find that when I try different mediums or I try different pencils, or I find different pencils for my Toon Boom Harmony that are always coming out or different, you know, things in Photoshop or whatever. I, I just find that I, I I grow as an artist because of it, because I'm pushing myself. You know, if you do the same thing all the time, you're going to get the same results. So break out, you know, that's why I say just expand yourself a little bit artistically. You might be happy with the changes that happen. Yeah, it's funny. A Wacom actually makes a high uni digital pencil. Or we could we use that we have one available. Oh really? You're talking yeah. about like a technical pencil? Yeah, a digital. It's a digital high uni pencil that can be used on the displays. Yeah. Oh oh, when it, like this? Yeah, yeah, but it's digital. Wow, I'll have to try that one too. Okay, Kyle, you can send me that also. I've never tried it, so I need one too, I don't think I have. Uh, Maybe I'm just getting it confused. Yeah, I. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting. Okay. Uh, does Harmony software allow you to keep the line weight variation or will it do a form of autocorrect? I missed the variation of line weight from the early days of animation. So much modern character animation is single line weight. You know, I'm, I'm going to share my screen again. Um, and maybe I can do some drawing here to answer some of this stuff too. But um, are you seeing my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. I'll just draw over here in this area. Um, but yeah, line weight, it, it, it will do, like I could do a light one. I don't know. Sorry. My Siri is talking again. I can go light and then the harder I push, see how it gets, it's darker, it's denser, it's thicker. Um, and that's just this brush. There's other brushes. This is a calligraphy brush, you know, um, this is a real soft brush. So sometimes I might do, if I put that in a different color, which I, you know, I can easily change colors to, then I can maybe rough out a scene if I want that kind of rougher feel. Here's another one, real rough. But I like that one a little smaller, probably. And this is good. You're not too concerned about color in your workflow, right? You just uh, do your roughs and clean up and then hand it off to somebody else to do coloring. Yeah, I don't I don't really do color at all. But even look at even in, even in this rush rough brush where we're seeing a lot of translucency, we're seeing through it. It's still a vector based shape, really, that I can manipulate. Yeah, that's cool. that like has the raster changed. look. But yeah, and if say if that was in a red i'm not switching back and forth that quick but say if that was like in a red i could go and i could change to a finer brush or a darker brush and i can refine that drawing right on top of it that's a separate oh, wow. line now you know and i can add details to it so the softer brush is really kind of going away. It's the same as I was doing on, on my 2D animation when I would use a different colored thing just to test it out or something. Now, and, then, and yet I could still, maybe I want these eyes closer together. I just pick one and slightly move it over. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty yeah, cool. That's hard to do on paper. 
And I can <laughs> still I can still erase like I can, if I don't like the fuzziness or something I can erase. I'm using the the other side of my my Cintiq stylus here, and I'm erasing there. But I can also change the size of that. So if I don't like how big it is, and there's different erasers. I even have erasers that because in the old days when I did 2D animation, I would be um, I would use a what a, a needed eraser because I only wanted to take a little bit off. I didn't want to yeah. erase all my lines. I just kind of wanted to kind of fade it back a little bit so then I can draw over it and kind of, you know, add in the details like I just did with that. Um, well, they have erasers now that are like that too, like a needed eraser and it'll just cut back a little bit. And I love that. I love that, um, that ability to do that. But yeah, to answer the question, yeah, thick and thin um, is that's the stylus that's making it have the ability to thick and thin or go lighter and darker, as some would say. Mm -hmm. but, and it depends on the brush, too. So some brushes are designed to have a little bit more give when it comes to thick and thin. Like here, this is like a Chinese brush. I'm just going to show you. And it really has a, and they call it a Chinese brush because it goes into this bleed the, the more. Because oh, yeah. if you push on it hard, it'll bleed more. Okay. There's a watercolor brush. And literally when you go over it, it kind of creates the layers. It gets darker and darker, like a watercolor brush does. Will you go in beforehand and change the pressure sensitivity of these tools, or do you just kind of go with what's there? Either on the Cintiq or on the yeah, I itself. I don't, but I, I know people that do because I know that you have, just like in Procreate, I see that too, that you can change the dynamics of a brush. And I know in uh, these, even before Procreate, you guys had started that where you could go in and, and, and just change things. Uh, I have never done that. I kind of pick up brushes as easy as I can um, and quick as I can and just take them and start working with them. And I tend to, I've learned a long time ago that I can adapt to a brush to make it work for my needs. Mm -hmm. And if I can, I move on to another brush. I just, I, I find another brush that I feel like is better. Um, but if I was, I know that I can do that if I was so driven. Yeah. This is more of an ink, ink line brush to it. How often are you adjusting the size of your brush? Um, I usually set it once <laughs> and then I move on. <laughs> Um, but I do have to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm always like, right when I open a scene or I start a scene in the day, um, I'll go and I'll just start to play with the brush first, do a little, I don't know. I tend to do like a Mickey mouse or something like that as I'm testing out a brush mm -hmm. and I'll go, Oh, I don't really like the thickness of that or whatever. And then I'll set it and then it'll be like that for the rest of the day. That's cool. And, That's completely opposite to me in my workflows. I'm like adjusting brush size every two or three strokes for different things. Oh, really? It's interesting. And that's, I think there's a question in the chat about uh, what's your favorite hotkeys. And for me in harmony is, O. I I set one of my express keys to O, so like you can adjust your brush size on the fly. So you're holding O and then dragging your pen left to right to adjust the brush size, which is oh, that's really, good really quick. Yeah. Yeah. I always have the undo <laughs> pretty close by <laughs> me. Um, I love too that, you know, when we get these scenes, a lot of times there's other stuff around it. Like you can see on, on here, a lot of times a production will give me the storyboards and they'll be playing here. When I push play, they can play here and I can oh, see cool. what the storyboard artist did. And so I have total control over this canvas too, to enlarge it and reduce it. And it, you know, and because it's digital, it doesn't get blurry or anything like that. Because it's vector based, I can blow this up or down, and the, the lines have the same feel and vibe to them, whether they're yep. big or little. But also, I, I store my charts on the outside of the, the, the screen, basically. So I'm always putting my charts over here. That's for cleanup or, or rough in betweeners. They can go and see those things. But when I'm animating, I'll probably go like right up to where, so I know where the borders are, I can position the frame exactly where I need it. And I can mm -hmm. see just the red of the frame there. Um, so now I know I'm animating in the, in the area that it has is going to be seen by the audience. Do you use onion skinning at all in Herman? Uh, yes, yes, I use it quite a bit. Um, 
I don't think I have it turned on right now. But yeah, um, where's my onion skinning? There we go. So yeah, I'll have it set up, onion skinning like this, especially when I'm doing rough in-betweens. And I can control, so the, the ones that are ahead of my, the frame I'm on, the, the frame I'm on is the darkest, of course, this black one. And mm -hmm. then in green is the, the frames uh, ahead of that frame. And in red are the frames that are behind that frame. And then down here, I can I can add, just by pulling this out, I can add more frames ahead or, more, or less frames, more or less frames there. I can have no frames ahead if I want to just see what came behind all the time. So I'm always moving forward in progression. Sure. But usually, usually I work with it pretty i'm usually just want to see one one ahead and one behind i try and keep it as simple as possible for me right because i'm simple minded <laughs> <laughs> hey, look at that now i'm seeing i got a little slow out here right so from this hand here to this hand here is a slow out i'm breaking the wrist see how the, his, his wrist is breaking a little bit as his arm goes forward and then i mm -hmm. pop to the release here and there's some multiple images there to help support that. And then it slows in again into this. So there's, that's all, that timing is all in the drawings because these are all on ones. You can't, uh, you can't time anything less than one frame, right? So the timing has to be in your drawings to get that snap. If you want it to have a little bit of slow in and slow out, that's gotta be in your drawings. And then he he pops over here pretty quick. I have, I have literally one frame for an anticipation here you only feel that, and then he's he's flipped over here. He's, he flips. Boom. He's on that side now, and he's already. And and what makes that work is that we're gonna see this frame up here more, and he's gonna. We have a little bit of a, a beat there where it's on two frames, and then he's gonna come down into the thrust. Boom. There's multiple images there, and then we see this. This is our next pose that we see a little bit more. And then this slows down in here. Now let's play that so you can see what it looks like. It's just that fast. That's awesome. It's just being like, I, I, you know, it's just like really fast in that moment. But that's called animation texture. That's giving texture to your animation performance, right? Fantastic. Oh, so we got two minutes and 22 seconds and I was asking my own question. So I apologize to everybody <laughs> in the chat. Um, there's a couple broad ones. Like, what do you think, what do you see the future for animation? Well, I feel that's a transition into AI. And I know this is where a lot of folks are thinking right now. There's a lot of concern about what AI means to entertainment in general. And it's not just animation, although that's what's relevant to us. Um, and it's mostly because we've seen videos like what the Corridor crew has done um, with their short that they came out with and, and others that are being developed just as quickly. Um, there's real advantages I see from that technology, but it has to be used in a very responsible way. And I'm, um, I'm all about, I think the government needs to step in to tell you the truth. I need right now, we need to start really setting up policies and procedures, laws, against copyrighted material. So um, what we should not be doing is accessing the internet freely, taking from artists and then using that as um, you know the, the target points basically. There's different names for it in AI, but the AI system has to have something to use as targets to, to go towards. And usually that's somebody's copyrighted or, or, or very personal and owned um, artwork that's all out there online. So everything that we've done with our Instagrams and, and marketing ourselves is kind of working against us a little bit when it comes to AI because everything's accessible. Yeah. Um, but that's where we need the government. We need agencies out there. We need artists. We need all of us to be like really on top of it and going, where did that come from? Did you create your own material for that to create those target points that AI is using? You know, um, and that's, to me, that's the future that needs to happen right now. That's the immediate feature, uh, future. And then, then there's probably ways that we can use it that's going to make our lives faster uh, or our productions faster, 
our lives better and um, and keep employed. That's the main thing. Artists yeah. need to be paid for the work that they're producing. And everything needs that human touch 